On behalf of my co-conveners, Dr. Sujay Kumar and Professors Nikolai Swigol, Rico Fischer, and Anike Makala, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to the EGU organizers and geoscientific community for this opportunity. Without your support, we would not be here today. Thank you. Let us begin. Now, we live at the cusp of ubiquitous observation, computation, and communication, a time when chasing Morin's laws through the von Neumann architecture is no longer sufficient, motivating a transition to hybrid architectures with dedicated accelerators and shared memory, a time when programs to learn to generate programs or images from natural language. Microprocessors and sensors alike have downsized into the space, energy, and cost-efficient designs, while disk capacities and internet speeds have grown exponentially parallel to transistor densities, giving rise to computing from cloud to edge. Uh, this has democratized information collection, um, storage, processing, communication, uh, blurring the lines between the real and the virtual, lending meaning to the term digital twin. Earth observation systems have increased in number and sophistication while shrinking in size and cost as Earth system models have expanded to incorporate newly discovered processes. Integrated circuits designed for 3D games and smartphones have enabled everything from drones, <coughs> CubeSats, and modern HPC systems to the deep learning breakthrough. Sensors key to robotics, such as the inertial measurement unit, have shrunk from 45 kilogram 200 watt systems to fingernail size 100 milliwatt circuits integrated in global positioning receivers. Laser scanners, too, are now commonly implemented on chip. Graphics accelerators and the latest mobile chips can perform as many flowing point operations per second, or flops, as the fastest supercomputers of the 1990s, using 10 rather than 1 million watts. Desktop graphics accelerators have gone from just 5 to 103 billion flops per watt, a 21 billion fold efficiency increase. Domain specific accelerators for AI are another 20 times more efficient at 2 trillion flops per watt. These numbers are so staggering that current technology would have appeared alien just 20 years ago, an era to which dynamic global vegetation models can trace their roots. These advances carry profound implications for the earth sciences, enabling new capabilities in earth observation and simulation modeling, or EOSIM, from geometric reconstruction to scientific machine learning. It is upon this technological substrate that we present an exciting series of talks that together paint a coherent vision for the future of land surface modeling from observation to simulation to their union. The key role and wide uncertainty of the land carbon sink in regulating atmospheric CO2 has placed increased importance on terrestrial biosphere models. Much of this uncertainty regards the world's forest, defined by the light intercepting canopies. While existing land models contain detailed one-dimensional physical and physiological processes, geometric realism is such that an entire forest of landscape would appear as a single homogeneous leaf or stack of leaves. Forest dynamics and many other spatial processes remain absent. Evolution, the generative process of life, is missing. This has vital implications not only for our ability to model the Earth system from abiogenesis to the present, but to model any planet that may potentially harbor life. An exciting merger is currently underway as global vegetation models look to downscale to improve geometric, physical, and biological realism the computer graphics and game development communities have turned to biology and physics to improve visual realism. Computer graphics has matured from physically based rendering to biologically and physically based 4D vegetation models and related observation systems. Game developers have begun applying deep learning to Earth observation records to produce realistic global environments or worlds. One recent game provides a world with over three petabytes in size from one meter to eight centimeter resolution with some two trillion trees 117 million lakes and 2 billion buildings. The entire land surface is procedurally generated every 72 hours using machine learning and photogrammetry programs running on graphics accelerators in the cloud. The game also blends physics with real-time observations to dynamically model atmospheric conditions. Such details would be the envy of any Earth scientist. Long after the invention of L-systems, detailed vegetation models may soon find their way into Earth system models. Earth observation data, Process models and the universal approximation abilities of artificial neural networks to show a way forward. Now is the time to blend phys physics based botanical tree models, gap models, forest landscape models, and terrestrial biosphere models into new hybrid land surface models of unrivaled geometric, physical, and biological realism. My personal journey down this line of research began over six years ago with two computer scientists at Stanford, uh, Yang Ang Lee and Sawun Perk. 
who unfortunately were unable to be here today, but who deserve due credit for their work. Let us now proceed with the talks. Thank you very much. So we are going to start off then with uh, Werner Rama and Rupert Seidel on new deep learning based approaches for forest modeling beyond the landscape scale. So thanks for coming. Uh, I hope the rest of the talk will go smoother than the start. Adam introduced the name of the talk already per echo for a couple of times, so I, I skipped this part. So the, 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 the perfect model should have high resolution in the functions of ecosystems that what Adam already mentioned in the introduction, but should also have high resolution in dem demographies like uh, regeneration, uh, seed production, and so on. In forest structure and composition, so that would be nice too. Should be on a fine spatial grain, should include spatial context, and should include human and natural disturbances, all in a way that the model is still high performant and has the ability to address large areas. So in a way, that's 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 this perfect thing. That's not that's a little bit unrealistic as this little cartoon depicts. It's like the Eierleg and the Wollmilchsau in German. So the, the, the one farm animal that can do everything. Uh, at no cost. This is clearly unrealistic, uh, and most models usually now concentrate on these two um, parts. So it's the high resolution in, in the functions, and it's the high performance, or the, at least the performance that is good enough to be able to uh, be applied on large scales. So one different approach I'd like to introduce here, it's called the uh, scaling vegetation dynamics concept. That's something that uh, we developed at TU Munich. And I'd like to highlight some of the features and show some results of an example application. From a slightly different perspective, um, detailed models uh, of forest dynamics, they are typically applicable on, on small areas such as single trees, uh, forest stands, one hectare or, or a couple of hectares. And those models are quite good in, in including structured and uh, demographic processes. And what we try, try to do is to uh, scale those up, uh, approaches up to larger scales. So the basic idea how we do this is called a state and transition approach. So that's nothing new. That's already around for a couple of, of years. Um, the key idea is to have vegetation in in, 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 uh, in states, in concrete states, and changes in vegetation are expressed as transitions between discrete states. So for example, here we have a cell, let's say it's a cell in state one, this can then go over time and change to another state, state two, and this, uh, this move is, is called a transition and it takes a certain time. Of course, it doesn't need to be deterministic, it can be uh, probabilistic by nature, so it could go different path, and and so on and so on. So how could you define those states? In in this uh, SVD approach, we have those the three dimensions of forest composition. That's the species uh, on the landscape, the forest structure, what we capture by using canopy height and a uh, functioning perspective, and here we use the density that the forest density. And these are then combined and such a system allows you to uh, have rather simple uh, and, and easy to interpret uh, states, for example, a uh, spruce dominated state with some beach in a certain height and in a certain density class. So the, the point here is that those states or that you can have hundreds and thousands of states in, in such a system and not just a, 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 a number of them. The question is then now how you can you can you could model uh, the transitions between uh, those potential states. And if you think about it, you will see that there are many factors influencing these probabilities. So, for instance, one is the current state and the current residence time, which is the, the time that a cell already is in a certain state. Then environmental drivers such as climate or site conditions. And also the spatial context, so the neighbors that uh, are <clears throat> around that cell. So all these 
points taken together is could be a rather complex uh, uh, equation. And for this equation, you we needed some kind of machinery. And yeah, in, in our context, that machinery is deep learning. So here, just very, very quickly, what is deep learning? It's basically a subfield uh, of machine learning. It's based on neural networks, which are already around for maybe 50 years. It's a very loosely inspired by, how, by the way, how the human brain works. So this, that's a single neuron in the brain and below it's a single compute node or neuron in the sense of, of deep learning. So it's, uh, uh, it's basically a, a set of weights of unconnected nodes that are then processed by a kind of activation function and connected in the network that has uh, inputs on the one side, outputs on the other side, and a number of hidden layers uh, in between. And having more than one hidden layer is uh, the reason why these are called deep uh, neural networks and deep learning because they have more than one such layer. So in the simple case, or in the most frequently used case, uh, such networks are, are used in the context of supervised learning. That means that the network learns uh, from examples. So that's called the training data. So the network is shown an example, the network makes a prediction and the error between or the difference between the example and the prediction from the model is then back propagated and in the end updates the weights between the nodes. And in, in that setup, the training data is key, is a very important part of the system. In the last years, and that's also something that Adam or, already alluded to, deep learning had a lot of, uh, a lot of, raised a lot of interest and also from the industry. So nowadays we have hardware that is very well able to run deep learning predictions uh, on, on, on GPUs, that's the graphic cards in your, in your computers. There are even specialized hardware now that is being built like these tensor processing units. Uh, then there's the software side. So the, nowadays we have a lot of easy to apply frameworks that let us allow to define these DNNs, to train them and to, to run them. And they can be used in your basically in your favorite uh, computing environments, for example, R. And there are a lot of other resources that allow you to uh, get some insights into uh, deep learning and training material. And it's easy to find answers if you have if you run into questions on Stack Overflow and, and other sites. So it is increasingly easy to apply uh, deep learning in science. And it is used already. So in, in environmental sciences, the most typical use cases of deep learning are so the very classical thing is classification. For instance, the identification of species from, from images uh, or uh, other pro, uh, applications in remote sensing. Then there is this field of ecological predictions where um, features are learned by a network that are difficult to, to define by hand. And there is this field of ecological models where um, DNNs are either used instead of or as a sub part uh, of a classical model or in this um, idea of meta modeling. Now, the really interesting part, and this is a, a, an image from, from a paper from Reichstein et al, is that basically the same algorithms and the same applications that are used in the industry at Google, at Facebook, they can be used as well in the environmental sciences. So if you have some algorithms that can differentiate between cats or dogs can also be used to, to, to classify patterns in climate data and so on. And so it's very easy for us to use the latest, newest developments in this very active field of deep learning and to apply those approaches also in, in our little uh, modeling world. So yeah, in, back to SVD, in our case, the deep learning networks are used for uh, the prediction of the transition probabilities between the states. And how are they then used? Or how is the training data, uh, from where comes the training data? 
as this is a crucial point in the whole deep learning approach. In our case, we use uh, process-based models on the slow, slower scale to generate the training data that is then used to, to train networks. So in a way, it's very simple. You take environmental conditions, climate, site conditions, and so on. You take vegetation, you put that into a process-based model, run simulations, and from that simulations, you generate or derive training data. The response variable is the transitions. So, and the predictors are all the, the, the factors that I described before. So basically you have climate, site, the spatial context, and so on. And those lead to simulated, uh, to simulated response to a transition in the vegetation. And when you apply the, the learned DNN on the landscape, uh, this is as follows. So you have the landscape, you look at the little red cell, you have the DNN, and then you just, in a dynamic simulation, put the same attributes into the DNN as during the training. So that is the state and residence time, the spatial context, environmental drivers. The DNN then predicts a classification result. So that's a probability distribution over um, the future state and over how long it takes until the state will change in the future. And this information is then uh, put back into the landscape and the landscape is updated accordingly. So the whole system is defined or is designed to run at the spatial grain of one hectare and at an annual time step. So to, to, uh, to show an application, I'd like to move you to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in the, in the US. So it's a landscape uh, with about 3 million hectares of forest. It's dominated by conifers, uh, lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, Engelmann spruce, and subalpine fir in higher elevation. The, the historic typical disturbance regime is of stand replacing fires. The question that we face now is how resilient are those forest types to future or potentially future climate and fire conditions? So why is that? That's because more fires are expected in the GYE. And this is the result of statistical modeling and a, a clear uh, effect of climate change. So it is expected that in the future or say uh, in, at the end of the century, that those exceptionally large fires uh, such as the 1988 fire, um, that such fires would, uh, will occur much more frequently and the fire return interval, uh, which is historically between 100 and 300 years, will, in the extreme cases, drop to below 20 years. So this has severe consequences on the, the vegetation because um, larger fires, more frequent fires, they limit the delivery of seeds, they limit the establishment uh, after fire, and they limit the seed supply. So trees are not able to grow to an age uh, where they produce seeds anymore, uh, the, the seed distance to seed sources gets too large and so on. And it's, a, it's rather straightforward to include disturbance um, to the SPD system. And it's in a way disturbances such as rapid transitions to different vegetation state compared to this more slower uh, transitions of a dynamic uh, vegetation development. And we can basically just add a module uh, to the SVD that in case of a disturbance updates the states more frequently and faster. So in our case, the SVD has a built-in fire module. Uh, this is similar as a module that uh, is used in the, in the process-based model islands that will be explained a little bit later. The fire spread is, is uh, influenced by topography, uh, by slope and, and wind direction and wind speed. And important here, it's constrained by both the availability of biomass that can burn, and there's a, a maximum fire size, which is in our case an external uh, parameter, mm -hmm. which comes from statistical modeling. And just to give you a better feeling of the, of the complete system, um, we simulate first with the, with the process-based model on stand level in this, in this uh, application case. Uh, we run many different uh, simulations with different vegetation, different climate, 
and fire conditions, we then generate data, use the DNN to train uh, basically the, the, the response of, of the model, whether regeneration successfully works or does not work based on the, on the forest type, and then run the combination on the whole um, Chiba E on the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And here is how it looks like, just an example. One, one animation you see on the map, the different forest types and the different colors. When I start the animation, you'll see also patches where, where actu actual burns happen. And after some time, if they fail to regenerate, they will turn to black. The same is on the, on the right-hand side is on the, on the graph. So it just start now. So in the first years, the fire frequency is not that high. And most fires are, are, are changed back to normal vegetation in the second half of the century. However, uh, fires are increasingly large, uh, the, the ex particularly on the Yellowstone Plateau, the big high elevation plateau. There are many fires, with, with, and a lot of them does not, uh, does not return to, to vegetation. Of course, you can then run different climate scenarios and run different analyses. Here in this particular case, the point is that with some probability, there will be a very large part of the, of the uh, area of the GBOE that with a failing regeneration and where we expect to miss uh, forest, closed forests in the future. Um, so, so already I'm at the conclusions. So the whole approach of, of using deep learning and a meta-modeling approach, that might be one, one way that, that large-scale uh, vegetation models can be built that include also more demographic processes and more structure and composition. And the SVD framework scales very efficiently. So we did some tests where we were at least able to run 25 million hectares in a very on moderate hardware, so to say. So it's not maybe not applicable for, for global simulations right now, but at least for, let's say, continental scale applications, they should be in reach. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, for being with us and sorry again for the for the start. Uh, I hope you will have some questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present our previous experiences and the latest developments of Finnish Geospatial Research Institute in doing 4D measurements. Here you can see an overview of the presentation. I will first present some of the earlier FGI experiences on doing 4D measurements from the past years. Then I'll present experiments of applying hypertemporal laser scanning time series to monitor structural dynamics in plants, FGI monitoring system, a permanent LIDAR phenology station. Finally, I'll summarize shortly the key experiences from the presented study cases. First, let's start with the earlier FGI experiences on doing 4D measurements. Already in early 2000, FGI experimented with multi-temporal change detection studies that used airborne laser scanning data. These experiments were carried out to both in built and in forest environments with the goal to automate change detection. These studies were multi-temporal with point clouds collected between one or more years. These studies focused on object level changes like removal of full trees or their large branches as presented in the figure. In these earliest studies, the change detection was based on height model comparisons. The ALS-based change detection studies were further refined to monitor forest growth and to assess growth dynamics. Here, the bottom figure visualizes how the younger vegetation here on left and on the right side of the panel present faster growth over the five-year period than the older trees here in the middle. 
FGI has also developed several new laser scanning platforms to be utilized in different measurement contexts. One of the longest running monitoring experiments that use mobile laser scanning platforms is the time series of topography changes in River Teno located in Finnish Lapland. The time series collection started there in 2008 and it has been annually updated ever since up to this date. Several different mobile platforms have been used in the change mapping over the years, including card-based, boat-based, UAV and personal mapping units. And as you know, drone-based imaging and mapping platforms have made a breakthrough over the past few years. FGI built their first prototype drone platform carrying a laser scanner already in 2010. One of the test cases for this system was to detect artificially caused defoliation in a conifer. The results found a clear agreement between the needle number and point cloud density and thus showed a potential in using multi-temporal UAV data for biomass change detection. The previous experiments shown have been about 3D change over time. But 4D measurements can also consider the object structure and its reflectance spectrum. In 2007, an FGA research group led by Dr. Sanna Kaasalainen started experiments with hyperspectral laser sources. This work culminated in 2012 into a development of a hyperspectral LIDAR prototype that was able to record simultaneously waveforms of eight user-selected wavelengths. On the right, you can see an example point cloud scanned with the hyperspectral LIDAR prototype. The point cloud represents a small apple tree colored with false colors using wavelengths selected from the visible range. In 2013, we decided to take the hyperspectral LiDAR prototype in the field to do a new hypertemporal change detection experiment. Our goal was to determine any changes in object reflectivity over a relatively short one-day time interval. Several artificial and natural targets were present in the study scene to compare temporal differences in their reflectivity. The scene was scanned once per hour with the FGI hyperspectral LiDAR. The experiment showed that the NDVR response of point clouds of natural targets presented clear changes just before sunrise. A closer look into the point cloud structure revealed clear systematic movements into tree canopy. The zoom in windows here on the right show a clear drooping motion of birch branches that started around sunset and continued about one hour after sunrise. We knew from the measurement records that the conditions had been stable with no airflows, no lighting, or with no precipitation. Therefore, the movements were likely related with the internal tree processes. To confirm this finding and to rule out any measurement errors, another experiment was set up a year later in Austria. The new study site was 1500 kilometers away from the original experiment location. While the tree and the laser scanner were different, the new experiment took place in otherwise similar late summer conditions. Also in this experiment, we were able to verify a similar branch movement overnight, which was dubbed as three sleep by one of the orders. However, the exact reason behind the movement was still left open at the time. After several talks with University of Helsinki and University of Eastern Finland researchers, we formed a hypothesis that one of the main reasons behind the branch movement 
could be the changes in the relative water content. The hypothesis was tested with data from three separate laser scanning time series experiments. Two experiments were done in the field, one in summer 2016 with leaves, leaf on conditions shown here on the left, and the other in autumn 2016 with leaves off. The third experiment was a long-term dehydration study done in controlled laboratory conditions where two test trees were let to dry over a period of 40 days. The figure here illustrates the branch movement detected in the summer time series. On left are selected point cloud clusters located in branch tips. On right, it can be seen how, they move, how these clusters move with respect to their initial position over time, with the movement having its maximum after sunrise. On right is also shown the vapor pressure deficit VPD over time. VPD is a function of air temperature and relative humid, humidity. VPD tells about the atmospheric water demand. It can be seen how the cluster movements have a lacked correlation with the VPD. In autumn data with leaf of conditions, the cluster movements attenuated significantly or ceased altogether. These results were in a good agreement with the hypothesis about the branch movement being related to the changes in plant's relative water content. And a study about these experiments was published recently as a preprint. After these experiments with individual trees, an opportunity arose to expand the concept of hypertemporal LIDAR time series towards more extended monitoring over a wider, for, wider forest area. In late 2018, FGI acquired a high performance laser scanner for an extended monitoring experiment. To monitor branch movements from a wide enough area, the scanner needed to be able to resolve two consequent points with about one centimeter spacing from each other at 100 meter distance and to have fast operation. An additional requirement was to have full year outdoor operability in finished conditions. To guarantee this, the system was installed in a protective cover. In 2019, the system was first tested in FGI premises in southern Finland for the duration of a full growth season, lasting from April until early November. The system measured repeatedly, twice per hour, the scene, the scene shown here in the left figure. The red rectangle highlights a birch branch whose reflectance response is shown here on the right. The panels clearly demonstrate how the birch branch reflectance was changing between early spring, midsummer, and in early and late autumn. This initial experiment was to test the system operability, and we did not collect additional ground reference data to link the time series with environmental effects. To make the full use of the new LiDAR station and to better understand the daily and seasonal changes visible in the point cloud time series, we obtained a permission from University of Helsinki to install our systems in Hytiela Forestry Field Station. The Hytiela Station has been founded over 100 years ago and, it's and it is located in the central Finland. It is a member of several international research infrastructures that monitor ecosystem and soil forest atmosphere processes of the forests and peatlands within and near the station area. Our scanner is installed about 30 meters about the ground level from, it, from where it monitors the surrounding boreal forest. The installation was started in autumn 2019 when an FGI designed custom made aluminum frame was first installed in the tower. A few months later, the scanner was transported to the forest station and fixed to the frame. 
after initial two-month testing period, regular scans were started in April 2020. In this animation, you can see an overview of the scan area between early April and late November in 2020. The view area covers about four hectares of the forest next to the tower where the scanner was installed. Each frame in the animation shows the point cloud reflectance mapped into image plane as seen from the scanner. The scans were selected with about one week interval and the scan timings were aimed near midnight. Windless and rainless conditions were also required. The areas highlighted with the blue and the magenta rectangles mark zoom in windows to the point cloud and demonstrate the level of detail. For example, it is possible to see how new leaves appear in May in the highlighted birch tree and how they are later shed off in autumn. At present, the scanner operates all day around the year. It measures once per hour a point cloud with 600 million points. The system operation has been robust. After one full year of operation, we have had only a few days missing all data due to technical or software issues. Our time series consists now of 7,000 scans and their number is incrementing every day. Out of these 7,000 scans, near 2,000 scans have been collected in stable conditions, meaning there has been low wind and no precipitation. Overall, the collected dataset is now about 60 terabytes in size, and it increases with 200 gigabytes of new data per day. The scanner sees over 1,000 trees, at least partially, within a 200 meter radius from the scanner. From these trees, we have been able to detect automatically over 900 tree stems near the scanner unit. On individual tree level, the time series have shown lots of interesting seasonal dynamics between different tree species. The results presented on this slide are still very preliminary and the animations are not synchronized, so please view each panel individually. All three panels show a point cloud of a single tree, and every point is colored with its normalized reflectance value. The point cloud of the deciduous perch in the left panel shows a clear shift in the volume and the reflectance levels as the seasons progress from spring to summer and then to autumn. What is maybe more interesting is that if you look at the lower branches of the pine in the middle panel, it is possible to see how its branches can move up to tens of centimeters even in one week's time. On the right panel, the dynamics of the spruce point cloud are the most delicate of these examples. If you look at, at the top of its canopy, the branches there lift gradually upwards when the autumn advances towards winter. It is easy to say that every tree is making its own dance through the seasons. And now let's summarize our key experiences in doing 4D measurements with long-term hypertemporal LiDAR time series. Hypertemporal laser scanning time series present a new exciting way to collect information on internal plant dynamics, both in individual plant and at forest level. However, to make the most use out of this new data, we need to accurate up-to-date ground reference information. Already existing time series will help to select and validate the most interesting phenomena seen in our time series. To do the key phenomena selection right, good knowledge on the local ecosystem processes, plant physiology, and weather conditions is essential. 
the hypertemporal high density point cloud studies presented here produce large amounts of data by design. Our permanent single wavelength station alone has produced tens of terabytes of raw data in a year. In future, it will be increasingly important to be able to select the optimal spatial, spectral, and temporal resolutions without losing the main signals from data while still limiting the data amounts. Our main goal is now to demonstrate the added value of long-term LiDAR monitoring stations in studying vegetation dynamics. To achieve this, we need to be able to select and calibrate our time series for the most important detectable phenomena. The more longer-term goal will be to optimize the resolution of time series collection, both spatially and temporally, to allow more flexible joint work together with other remote sensing platforms. When these requirements are met, we are hoping to see a growing number of similar long-term LiDAR monitoring units installed in other research sites around the world. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you. Good you afternoon, today. everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present our previous experience. Sorry about that. Thank you, Etu, for the very fascinating talk. And uh, now, in the case, or the, in the interest of timeliness, we will move on to the next uh, presenter. We have uh, Renato Braguire presenting on better representing vegetation canopy structure in Earth system models. Thank you. Adam, for the introduction. Can you hear me well and see my slides? Awesome. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, OK, so thank you very much for the invitation, Adam. Such important topic. Um, and hopefully now it's going to go smoother than <laughs> the previous ones that were also very interesting. So today I want to share with you about a bit of the work that I've been developing the past few years, where I, I thought about how to better represent vegetation canopy structure in their system models. Uh, of course, I would like to thank all my collaborators that helped me with this work. And I also want to say that I'm all the way here in California, so it's very early. <laughs> um, and I am the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So we are very interested in remote sensing uh, and 3D canopy structure in general. So I always like to start this uh, presentation about Earth system models, showing these three plots from the latest CIMIP simulations. So here, these three plots show the land uptake from 1850 up to the end of the century, according to 11 Earth system models in three different CIMIP simulations. So the one on the left-hand side shows the CIMIP-4, the one in the middle, CIMIP-5, and the one on the right-hand side shows the CIMIP-6 simulations. And what is striking to the eye is actually the fact that along the years, although these this Earth system models have been developed and have been uh, adding new and new processes, they still disagree not only on the sign, but also the magnitude of the land uptake by the end of the century. Um, and why is that? Why do these models disagree so uh, among themselves? And so according to the IPCC report, um, some crucial processes are still missing in uh, those Earth system models. So in this plot here, I show the sensitivity of land carbon uptake to precipitation versus temperature. And each dot in the uh, plot shows you a land surface model from those 11 Earth system models that I showed you before. So as you can see, each model has a different sensitivity to carbon uptake. And of course, different models will have different sensitivities because each one of these models have different processes. Some represent nitrogen cycles, um, the, the nitrogen cycles, some, uh, some others don't. Some have a different representations about their different processes. But in general, the IPCC also points out to the fact that these models have something in common, which is the... Uh, and here I quote, the transfer of radiation, water, and heat in the vegetation soil atmosphere continuum 
are treated very simply in the global um, ecosystem models. And uh, so I was lucky enough to spend some time in the Amazon rainforest working with flux tower data. And when I took these two pictures here, so the one on the left hand side shows me at the top of the flux tower pointing to the horizon. And when we look at the Amazon rainforest from above the flux tower, this flux tower is 82 meters high. Um, we actually see that the Amazon rainforest is this massive green carpet of leaves. So from above the flux tower is actually, um, we can actually say that the Amazon rainforest is, it looks like a big leaf from, uh, from up there. Now from below the flux tower, we see that the Amazon rainforest is a little different. Um, so we have um, the, the, the leaves have angular orientation, different angular orientations. The canopy has gaps where the light can propagate through. Um, the, the canopy has some vertical orientation uh, and some vertical profile of leaf area index. And so the approximation of a big leaf, even for the Amazon, uh, it's probably not um, very accurate. So one way to uh, test that is um, actually to think about how these land surface models treat the transfer of radiation. And so here I show you this figure. It's a representation of what a canopy, a vegetation canopy looks like in one of those models. So these models often use the two stream scheme and they use the two stream scheme because the two stream scheme is uh, efficient, uh, very fast and can be run over very large areas for very long periods of time. It also treats uh, the radiation separately between direct and diffuse radiation, accounts for all sorts of um, all orders of multiple scattering. Uh, and the idea is we have some radiation, solar radiation uh, reaching the top of the canopy and interacting with this cloud of randomly distributed green dots, uh, I, I must say, um, and interacting with a, a radiative effective surface underneath this canopy. And so the Earth system model, the land surface model wants two, mainly two variables from the radiative transfer scheme. The first one is the amount of absorbed PA, photosynthetically active radiation, because that will drive photosynthesis later on uh, when coupled to the ecophysiology model, um, and also the albedo uh, of the surface that will impact all the atmospheric processes later on in terms of the uh, surface energy budget. Um, in reality, we know that a canopy doesn't look much like a cloud of randomly distributed dots. So one way to calculate the bias between the homogeneous canopy uh, case and heterogeneous canopies is actually comparing the tree stream scheme or this 1D radiative transfer model with more complex 3D radiative transfer models. Or in this case, I use the Maestra uh, 3D radiative transfer model. So in here, what I did was to fix LAI or the optical depth of this vegetation canopy or this scene constant and equals to 1.5 meters square per meter square. And all I did was to vary the density of the canopy. So adding spaces in between trees. So we have three different densities, the dense case, the medium case, and the sparse case. And so in the 3D model, you have to give the position of every tree, how the LAI varies vertically and so on. But by doing that, and calculating the, um, the sun zenith angle profile of FAPA, which is the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, and albedo PA, uh, we see that the tree stream scheme overestimates all the other um, all the other canopy scenes in terms of fraction of absorbed um, photosynthetically active radiation. And when we go to the sparse case, we actually see that the bias can be huge, right? Can be in the order of 40, 40 something percent. The ISO here in the plots show the case where the radiation is totally diffused. So we can actually see that it really doesn't matter much if the radiation is direct or diffused. 
the heterogeneous canopy in terms of gappiness uh, impacts the absorption and reflectance of the surface in comparison to the 1D scheme. So uh, I think one, one first question that people ask is like, okay, so if we already have 3D radiative transfer models, why did we still use 1D ones? Well, I guess for two main reasons. The first one is we don't have enough data to parameterize 3D models globally. That's the first one. But the second one is uh, we don't have enough computing power to run these models globally. And so one way uh, or one question we may ask is, can we keep the efficiency uh, and robustness of the two stream scheme, but um, getting the accuracy that these 3D models provide in terms of absor absorption and reflectance of the surface. And so to do so, we um, brought up into these models uh, the concept of the clumping index. So the clumping index is this variable or this combination of variables, this equation that we multiply our true LAI by or our um, optical depth and turn this optical depth of this canopy into an effective optical depth in radiative terms uh, in order to um, in order to replicate or to ap approximate the black curve to the other colorful curves in terms of FAPA. So the clumping index accounts for the really the gappiness of this vegetation canopies or how clumped are trees or leaves within a tree. Um, but when people talk about canopy structure, it's um, it's funny because people often mean different things. So when some people talk about canopy structure, they're talking about canopy high, some others talk about leaf angular distribution, some others talk about canopy uh, spaces or gappiness. But in reality, canopy 3D structure is all that, right? Is the, is the vertical uh, profile of LAI, is the gappiness of the canopy and so on. And so the way we added the clumping index into this, uh, radiative transfer models and lens surface models was by changing the light extinction coefficient. So this equation here, and I promise is the only equation in the presentation, um, shows the direct transmittance uh, of the canopy, which is the missing term in terms of absorptance, reflectance, and the direct transmittance is, is the other term of the radiation partitioning. Um, it, the, the direct transmittance follows a beer lambert um, law, where um, the right transmittance is equal the exponential decay of, um, that is related to the optical depth of the canopy, which is the LAI, divided by the cosine of the um, theta. Theta is the angle of the incident radiation in this canopy, or in the case of a land surface model, is the sun's uh, angle. And so the light extinction coefficient is this term that will modulate LAI up or down to really uh, try to account for the whole heterogeneous structure of this canopy. And so often this light extinction coefficient is equals to leaf angular distribution function times the clumping index. So by inverting this equation, we can now derive the clumping index that we need so much and add this value into lens surface models and see what happens. So in here, I show you the results for two sites that we tested. One site is a dense old Aspen site in Canada. And the other site is a, it's a sparser blue oak savanna site in California. And we compare two different types of direct transmittance uh, for these canopies. The first one is a observed direct transmittance where we actually go into the field and take pictures, digital hemispherical photographs, of the canopy. The idea here, as I show in this, um, the, the, the first figure you see, is a, a, a digital hemispherical photograph in California. And then we have to threshold that picture into black and white pixels. And we say that whatever is black is canopy and whatever is white is background sky. By doing that, we can then calculate the direct transmittance for all zenith angles from the middle of the picture where zenith is zero 
up to the border of the picture where then it is 90. Um, and all the azimuth uh, angles as well. So from zero to 360. And of course we average out the azimuth because what we are interested on here is really the zenith profile of direct transmittance. And the second methodology is actually using 3D modeling. Uh, so over Tonzi Ranch in California, the Blue Oak Savannah, we actually got some LIDAR data from um, um, a LIDAR that flew over the forest. And we actually measured the position of every single tree and the shape of every single tree. And we input the uh, radiative transfer model and calculated the direct transmitted. For the old Aspen side, it's a much more, um, let's say, hardcore methodology where people actually go into the field and measure the position of every tree within the space and et cetera. So when we actually derive the, um, the direct transmissivity in terms of sun zenith angle, we get these two results. So the figure on the left-hand side shows the direct transmittance for the old Aspen site in Canada and the right-hand side for the Blue Oak Savannah. Uh, the Maestra model or Maestra model is the three, 3D scheme. So the red line represents the 3D uh, model and the dashed lines represent the digital hemispherical photographs. So what we can see is that the 3D uh, model and the observations actually are underestimated by the two stream scheme. And so what, what we did was, what, what would be the number necessary by inverting that equation I showed before that will make this black curve move on top of the other two curves? So for the old Aspen side, this value is 0 0.66. And for the Blue Oak Savannah, that value is 0 0.46. Uh, so now that we have clumping index, so we run a land surface model with that. So the land surface models we run was Jules. Jules is the land surface model of the UKSM, the British Air System model. And here I show you the FA par, the diurnal profile of FA par for the old Aspen site and Blue Oak site. The green lines here show the, the results from the two stream scheme or the land surface model, Jules. And the red lines show the results for the um, for the the modified version with clumping index. And so what we can see is that for both sites, the when we add the clumping, the fraction of absorbed radiation decreases in comparison to the default version of the model. So okay, so if we have less absorption, we would expect less productivity, maybe. And so what we did was, okay, so now that we have the radiative transfer scheme with a land surface model, simply let's run uh, the full land surface model and get a, a, a proxy, um, an estimate of gross primary production or actually the productivity of that forest, GPP. And so here I show you GPP for uh, versus time of the day. And the green lines show the model, um, the default version of the model and the um, red line shows the new model. So for the old Aspen side, what we see is that the clumping index version increases productivity. And for the Blue Oak Savannah, we don't see much difference. And that's key because for the Blue Oak Savannah, it's a site in California. So it's very, very bright and very, very sparse. So light is not a limiting factor for productivity for that site. So that's why we don't see much change, even when we correct the land surface model. Now, for the dense site, we see an increase in productivity, even though we decrease the uh, fraction of absorbed radiation. And why is that? How is that possible that we decrease uh, absorption, but we increase productivity? And that is because of the nature of the of joules of this land surface model. Uh, joules is a multi-layer model, so photosynthesis is calculated in layers. So what happens when we add clumping into joules is that we create gaps in this canopy, allowing radiation to go through the canopy, reaching bottom layers. And so all the extra productivity we see is this GP, extra GPP coming from the bottom of this canopy. This plot shows the vertical profile. And every, every time you see a red area here, a pink area, is more productivity. So the productivity is really coming from the bottom layers. Uh, 
now, if we can do that for a site level, we can do that for the globe. So we use a global clumping index map derived from MODIS um, that looks like this one. So when clumping index is closer to one, it's closer to the homogeneous case. And when it's closer to zero, it's closer to a, a more clumped canopy or more the heterogeneous case. As you can see, the, the dark green areas represent middle leaf forests that are very, very clumped. And so that's why we have this pattern of clumping index in the world. So now when we actually plot this, when we introduce that global clumping index map into joules and run globally, we can actually see what the bias would be. So here in this plot, I show you the GPP difference between the, um, the model with clumping minus the model without clumping. And we get an extra productivity of 5.5 petagrams of carbon per year globally, with much of the bias, 75%, coming from the tropics. When we compare now that with a, um, the FluxNet MTE GPP, which is, a, which is a global product of GPP that was a scale up with flux tower data and machine learning techniques, we get a better agreement with, uh, with, the, with the observations when we add this um, uh, heterogeneity of canopies. And so to conclude, um, I think the main message is that it is possible nowadays to uh, make a 1D radiator transfer scheme, reproduce the radiation partitioning of more complex 3D ones, but without losing the efficiency needed, still needed by this earth system models. When we add the clumping index into a land surface model, we get uh, an impact uh, on productivity, but mostly on light limited regions like the tropics uh, or very dense um, sites. And when we added clumping into this uh, land surface model, we increased photosynthesis worldwide by five petagrams uh, of carbon per year. And so in the future, what would be the next steps or what we think will be the next steps? So first off, model benchmarking. So the fact that we have these models that are very simple, but efficient, the big leaf models, and other models that are very, very complex and very, very heavy to run, we should compare more these models and see if they agree. And if they don't agree, why not? And where do they agree? And now uh, we live in a very exciting era, uh, e to show a beautiful uh, data set of uh, canopy structure from a tower, but we also have a Jedi LAI profile now. So we actually have remote sensing data uh, scanning all over the globe and measuring the vertical profile of leaf area index. And now we can actually capture uh, the vertical structure of um, of heterogeneous canopy and hopefully bring on all that extra information into our system models and perform better uh, projections. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Renato, for the very interesting discussion and for the um, excellent uh, scientific contribution. Um, next, we'll move on to general ecosystem models, moving towards modeling responses and effects of whole ecosystems. Uh, with Mike Harfoot uh, presenting. Thanks, Adam. Okay, can you guys see my slides? Yeah, okay, then I'll begin. So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you for the um, uh, opportunity to present here. Um, it's very kind. Oh, if I jump back to my slide view. Sorry, just checking. You can still see my slides? Okay. We can see them and we can hear you talking. Okay, great. Lovely. Yeah, so, so thanks a lot, um, Adam and the conveners for the opportunity to, to present today. So I'm going to be talking about some of the work we've been doing developing a class of models called general ecosystem models. 
and, and my thoughts on how they might move us towards um, representing responses of whole ecosystems and effects um, upon uh, global change. I'm going to start off by, um, by, by I guess, presenting this figure, which, which demonstrates um, um, one of the striking aspects about our planet, and that is the diversity of life on it. Um, and that, that life is obviously fundamental for us having a habitable planet, and it's fundamental to what the processes that we want to try and represent in the system models. Um, but biodiversity is also complex, um, and this demonstrates that there's a load of processes happening at different levels of organization in that system, from evolutionary and biogeographic ones through uh, demographic population and community ones up to the, the functioning of organisms at, at broader ecosystem levels. And perhaps because of that complexity, um, uh, many approaches to modeling uh, ecosystems, particularly from a biodiversity perspective, take a statistical point of view. And that's particularly true from the terrestrial perspective. Um, but I'm going to make the argument here, um, since we're in this as a domain of the climate system, um, that the climate system is also complex, but we've had mechanistic models um, of the whole climate system for, uh, we've been developing them for over 60 years now, from, from back in 1956 when the, the first general circulation model was, was um, put forward. Um, and so I'm just going to give a health warning. So, so from my point of view, it's in early days for general ecosystem models. Right? I, I think we're back in the sort of 1950s or 60s of global circulation models or general circulation models. Um, we're not quite on computers with only five kilobytes of memory, although that's improved. But I think the kind of simplicity of the model compared to reality um, is certainly something I want you to take home. But, but we are developing fast, right? and with lots of promise. And so. Um, Again, so, so the, the model we wanted to build was really a, um, has some analogies to the climate system. So, so like with those models where we have gridded representation of, of, um, of space and we're modeling the processes by which the climate system um, the dynamics are, are, are determined, uh, we wanted to generate a spatially explicit uh, mechanistic model of, of whole ecosystems and by which we mean all organisms and ecosystems um, that can be applied in a, with a similar model formulation on land and in ocean environments um, that was um, specified really at the level of individuals, individual organisms, because that's the, the level at which really ecology plays out. Um, and then we have emergent properties um, or higher level properties rather than emerge from those dynamics and individuals. Um, we're trying to develop the model in an open and reproducible manner. And so the, the code is, is available on, on GitHub. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but sorry, in order to try and represent um, all of that, um, uh, 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 um, to, to model life in that general way, we have to make several abstractions away from reality, at least we do in the, in the, in the current state. And so the model is formulated um, by describing uh, um, organisms, and this case I'm going to focus primarily on animals, um, I'll touch on, on the plant part of the model in a, in a little while. But we describe organisms according to a set of functional traits. So we don't we don't treat species specifically. We ignore taxonomic identity. We describe animals according to how what their functional traits are, and that um, means a set of uh, categorical traits. So their feeding mode, whether they are herbivorous, omnivorous, or carnivorous, their metabolic pathway, whether they're warm-blooded or cold-blooded, how they move and how they reproduce offspring in the model. And then a set of continuous traits for the um, adult body mass and the mass at which they become reproductively, reproductively mature, a juvenile mass, which is the mass at which they would enter into the model as an offspring, and then at any point in time, a current body mass. And, and lastly, because we can't, for computational reasons, model every single individual um, separately or independently, we cluster organisms together into what we call cohorts. So, so the, the fundamental agents of the model have a set of traits including a current body mass, which is varying through time, and also an abundance of individuals in that case. And those agents undergo a set of uh, what we describe fundamental ecological processes. So they metabolize, they feed, they reproduce, and they die. And if we run the model uh, in a grid-based environment, then they also disperse from one location to another. Uh, and we can run the model flexibly in terms of uh, where it's positioned in the world, um, as I say, on the land or, or on the, in the water, and also um, with varying sort of grid sizes as well, reflecting different different uh, simulations that we want to perform. 
And, and what, what we find really um, amazing is that, I mean, so the model is incredibly simplistic compared to reality, but it, because it's got this individual based approach, um, it can generate um, a large number of different uh, estimates or, or predictions for variables that are relevant for biodiversity and relevant for ecosystem function. And although in any given location, they can be quite wrong, and, and I'm happy to talk about some of those, um, those um, uh, mismatches in detail if you want to, but it, they also generate predictions which are very plausible compared to reality. And we can look at, compare the model to empirical data across a range of scales. So on an individual scale, um, the model here represented in black points um, compared to empirical data in gray points. Um, predicts the growth rate of individual organisms in a really realistic way. Uh, again, a big point, sorry, I've got that wrong enough. The black points are empirical and the gray points are model predictions. And if we look at the second figure on the individual scale, lifetime reproductive success of individuals in the model follows a similar trend to that of, um, of empirical data, uh, but with far greater variation, which may reflect sampling biases and other processes going on in both the empirical data and also what the model is talking about. At the community scale, um, we can make predictions about the, um, the numbers of individuals of different body sizes in an ecosystem. And here I'm showing them in red for carnivores, blue for omnivores and green for herbivores. And when we compare those to empirical data for similar, for, for, for the same trophic levels within an ecosystem, then um, our estimates for the slope of that relationship fit the, fit the empirical data. And then if we look at broad scale, macroecological scale patterns, in this case, comparing on the top the model predicted functional richness, so something about the diversity of the ecosystem functioning in a given environment, again here focusing on uh, animals, and compare that to empirical functional richness, we find there are broad similarities in where, where we find more greater richness of animals um, uh, it, it, it compared to the empirical data. And in addition, the model can sort of speak to ecosystem functioning, so it's a functional rates. So in addition to functional diversity, which I started to introduce on the last slide, the model can talk about uh, mean trophic level of ecosystems, which is a, a variable which describes sort of how long food chains are in a system. That's been used quite widely in, in fishery sciences to talk about how um, marine ecosystems are being uh, affected by fisheries pressure, for example. And as a measure of how fast energy flows through uh, ecosystems from primary producers up to apex predators. We can talk about secondary production, so how much of primary production has been consumed by herbivores, and talk about biomass and nutrient turnover rates, um, and indeed insectivity, how much, how much feeding, for example, on insects is occurring, which is important from a uh, pest control perspective. And then also functions like nectivory or fructivory, which are, are things we're, we're uh, focusing on at the moment. So how much um, pollination services might be provided by nectar eating organisms or how much seed dispersal might be provided by fruit eating organisms, for example. And the model's been used already for some quite interesting experiments, um, particularly in the realm of rewilding and restoration. Um, and, and it has, I think, great potential for trying to inform how nature-based solutions might play out in the future and how effective they might be from an ecosystem perspective. On the left here, I'm just showing some, some uh, trophic interaction networks from the model, um, from a few sets of sites um, uh, where we've removed essentially large carnivores from the model and looked at, looked at what effect that might have had on the ecosystem structure. So the orange points on the left show um, the original ecosystem state and the blue, blue points and interactions represent the, the state that emerges once we've taken out those large carnivores. So we see this remapping of ecosystems and that would have effects essentially on the, on the vegetation dynamics in that system as well. And on the right, we're modeling at the global scale what happens when we remove um, essentially mega herbivores. So the largest herbivores from the simulations um, starting in a, a, a pre-human world, in a Holocene state where we had really large grazing mammals around across lots of the world. What happens when we remove those? Uh, and what even happens if we take out large herbivores from the present day. And what we find is that um, from the simulations that the smaller uh, animals, particularly smaller herbivores, don't compensate for a loss of those large, larger animals from the ecosystem. 
so we see uh, reduction in the total biomass of organisms, but also in the um, and then uh, again, sort of in parallel to all of that, we've been using the model um, in the same way that climate models are used for um, scenario exercises. So as part of the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is the biodiversity equivalent of the IPCC, um, in, in, <laughs> to be very succinct, um, we've been using the model to, to reconstruct ecosystems in the year 1900 and run them forward in time using historical data on climate and land use primarily to the present day or to 2005, and then run a set of scenarios into the future about how ecosystems might change and here again, I'm talking mostly about animals and ecosystems um, might change into the future. And when we do that, we find again that there's been some fairly consistent, or sorry, fairly persistent changes happening to ecosystems through time. Um, for the middle two figures I'm showing here represent global averages for this variable of mean tropic level and for ecosystem metabolic rate. So we can see that ecosystems have through time been getting very good. Food webs, for example, have been getting shorter through time. So we've been removing uh, uh, apex predators or the sort of larger, more um, higher um, uh, trophic level individuals from systems and squishing down through chains to be shorter. And we've seen an increase in the metabolic rate of ecosystems overall um, as, as the energy turnover of the systems has increased. And metrics of functional diversity show we've lost quite a lot of functional richness. These panels on the right are showing the, the thick line represents a global, global average, and the thin lines represent um, uh, it, their sub regions, essentially different parts of the world. Um, and we see there's quite a lot of variation across regions, with some regions declining by 25% compared to their state in 1900. On average, across the world, they're declining by, by 5 to 10%. Um, so, but, but in, in conjunction with that functional richness change, which is, which is the functional richness is describing the diversity of, of our animal community, the functional turnover on the bottom is showing how similar is a given state of those uh, functional traits of animals compared to the, 19, the state in 1900. And, and what it's showing is that there's been really ongoing turnover of the functional traits of those uh, uh, animals. So that the ecosystems in, in the present day and even in 2050 will be very dissimilar from those in 1900. And now we, we know from sort of recent um, analyses that the, there will be significant effects of those changes in the functional composition of animals on, um, on the earth system and including uh, or in addition to uh, human society. Uh, so this nice paper in 2018 from Oswald Schmitz and colleague uh, looked at or tried to summarize the effect of, of uh, animals on earth system dynamics, particularly nutrient cycling, and they coined the frame, phrase uh, zoo geochemistry to explain how animals might be playing a role in geochemical cycling. And then another paper uh, by Chris Doty and colleagues back in 2016 tried to estimate the effect of the removal of large um, mammals from ecosystems on, in this case, phosphorus cycling. So in, in pre-human times, large mammals, uh, both in the oceans and on land, combined with anadromous fish and seabirds, may have been recycling large amounts of phosphorus from ocean, um, from, from marine systems back onto land and dispersing that across the landmass. But just to, just to dig into that a little bit in more detail, so the um, Schmidt little paper summarized um, a various um, empirical data where it, it, um, of, of studies in which um, animals or particular types of animals have been excluded from ecosystems. And then the rates of, of, of carbon cycling in this case have been measured to see what the effect of those animals have, was on cycling rates. And um, the figures actually are quite, quite hard to interpret, but the green, green uh, lines represent where the animal exposure has um, uh, decreased um, carbon cycling rates. In other words, animals are having a, a positive effect on carbon cycling. And the pink, pink lines represent the, the opposite. And we've got herbivores on the left and carnivores on the right. But the, the main key point I want to take away from this is that the, 
the magnitude of effects of, of animals is really quite big. So it's similar to the effects, to similar in magnitude to that um, um, when animals are not present in the system. So in other words, they, have, they could be having quite a, a, a significant or dominant effect on carbon cycling rates in different ecosystems. And put in a more simple way, this plot on the right-hand side is showing how much of primary production is being consumed by animals across different ecosystem types based on empirical data. And we can see for some ecosystems, particularly grasslands, we get as much as a third of the MPP being consumed by, by herbivores in this case. And across um, a lot of forest, um, temperate tropical shrublands and forests, then we're getting 7% uh, up to potentially a tenth of the MPP being removed by uh, animal consumers, by herbivores. And of course, in, in forested systems, the primary agents of that herbivory are insects. Um, and this really neat study uh, by Dan Metcalf and colleagues back in 2013 compared the accounts um, or nutrient um, accounts of um, uh, study locations where anim, uh, insect herbivory had been excluded and where it was present. And they found that the, the insects feeding on leaves, particularly those leaves which were in a really nutritious state, so they had a lot high, high um, nitrogen to carbon or phosphorus to carbon ratios, um, led to uh, additions of nitrogen and phosphorus into the soils that were comparable to background rates for nitrogen or even far greater than background rates for phosphorus. So the animals in this system are playing a really important role in, in nutrient cycling. And so this leads me into the kind of development that we're interested in from a general ecosystem model perspective. Um, and that might, might relate, relate to linking animals into um, earth system models. So we've been comparing predictions that we make on insect uh, herbivory rates in tropical forests to empirical data. And this is very early work done in collaboration with Chris Rodney and Andrew Abraham at NAU. And we find some really interesting patterns. So, so the, the pleasing thing is the model isn't, isn't um, outrageously bad. It's not entirely consistent. And the most interesting thing for me is that we find in some locations like this set here, which run along an elevational gradient, because we're not representing anything about elevation effects in the model, we don't capture any variation between the, the herbivory rates across, across this gradient. So it's pointing to processes that might be important, but as, in, a, in a sort of broad um, finger in the air, the model's not doing a terrible job but there's things that we'd like to improve about representation of insects and, and, and uh, herbivory rates, particularly in trop tropical forests, where they're important. One of those changes um, is incorporating vertical structure into the model. So we've been working again with Chris and colleagues at NAU, um, working with JEDI um, LIDAR data to try and get a better handle on vertical structure of vegetation. Uh, in ecosystems so that we can improve the way that animals interact with it. But the minute the model is working as in panel A, so all the animals in the model interact with essentially a green slime <laughs> that's spread over the floor, whereas clearly we'd like to have some vertical structure which differentiates uh, where productivity and the different types of productivity that occur in ecosystems so that different animals can access them. Uh, so in essence, in tropical forests, most of the production is unavailable for the largest animals purely because um, they can't um, access the tops of trees because the, the, the trees aren't, the branches aren't strong enough. So that's work that on, is ongoing in trying to have animals interact with vertical structure. Uh, and the other um, key piece of work is, is allowing the animals in the model to interact with a more sophisticated model of, um, of vegetation dynamics. So the, in the original version of the model, we used a sort of semi-mechanistic um, a uh, carbon cycle model to determine production of net primary production and allocation of production to different um, plant um, structures or strength uh, compartments. Um, but in collaboration with, with um, Almut Arneth and um, Jens Kraus at KIT down in Garmisch, uh, we've been linking the model to uh, the LPJ gas model, which they run there, which uh, many of you probably know, but is an individual based model of of um, vegetation dynamics that's uh, also using a functional trait-based approach. 
And, and just a snippet of, of the outcome of that, which I find really fascinating. What I'm showing you, uh, sorry, and at the, same, at the moment, just to back up with a second, at the, at the moment, the only coupling we've got is the LPJ gas driving herbivory in the model. So the herbivores aren't affecting the vegetation structure in LPJ gas yet. But even that relatively simple change seems to make a, a big difference to the, to the realism of the, both the biomass of herbivores that we have in the model and the, the rate at which they're consuming um, vegetation. Um, so in these figures on the bottom here, the black line represents the, the empirical data I showed earlier uh, on bi herbivore biomass and herbivore consumption as a function of net primary productivity. The green points represent the original Madigny version, and the blue triangles represent this, uh, this, this one-way coupled version. And we're finding a far more consistent um, relationship between productivity and herbivore biomass and herbivore consumption with the one-way coupled model. So just a better representation of plants seems to really improve the model um, greatly. And obviously the next step for us there is, is, is to incorporate a two-way coupling where the animal herbivory is affecting the composition in LPJ gas and nitrogen dynamics can play a role in, in herbivory rates. So I'm going to summary, uh, finish up with some next steps um, uh, for particularly for the mining aspects of, of, the, of this modeling. So I think one of the key things that we need to do is bring the model closer to data. So using data integration techniques um, and Bayesian uh, statistics um, so that we can do several things. One is to formally uh, understand where uncertainty comes from in the ecological processes that we have in the model. Because I think at least in ecology, we don't have that broad overview of what, what processes seem to be more uncertain compared to others. And that will also guide more objective model development as we try to make the model more realistic. Um, obviously, it allows us to make predictions with uncertainty, which we can associate with the, the, the um, information that we're providing to decision makers. And it will probably help, I think, in conjunction with sort of ecological forecasting techniques to, to, to work with a simulation of observational data um, to, to generate um, sort of reanalysis type of products. Um, and, and lastly, I think there's to my, to my mind, um, I think there's really great potential and actually importance in linking animals into our consideration of land system uh, processes, um, primarily because animals can be very important for dynamics. We see that in some really uh, important examples, for example, um, uh, boreal ecosystems where pest outbreaks um, can be driving um, non-linear linear dynamics in those systems, interacting with bio. Uh, and where the whole ecosystem context there is important for those uh, pest outbreaks. And the same might be true for reindeer, for example, in um, tundra type ecosystems. And so um, with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again to Adam and conveners for the opportunity to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mike, for the fascinating and excellent results from the Magdalene model. It's absolutely wonderful to see. And uh, I think it's in one of the major underserved areas of land service models currently. So yeah, it's wonderful work. Um, I think for the interest of time, we'll probably be skipping through the questions if that's okay. It's, um, we have one last talk to give, which is Milos. And Hello. See. Hello. So we're going to conclude our session with a true digital twin that directly couples visually and physically realistic atmospheric and vegetation models. So Milos uh, from Adam Mikiewicz University will now present an exciting development of 4D or interactive 3D eco-climate simulations. All right, so I hope you can hear me well and see uh, my, share, my screen shirt. Can you see the slides? Yeah, I hope so. All right, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, our results. Uh, as uh, Adam uh, introduced me, I'm a PhD student at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. And uh, in our team, we have worked on ecosystems and cloud simulation, mainly for the graphics community. Our aim was to create realistic 3D simulations with an emphasis on the computational efficiency. 
Uh, the results we want to present today are based on our attempt to combine three models. Uh, the previously mentioned ecosystem and cloud models together with a soil model. This allows us to describe a more comprehensive water cycle and consequently a more accurate simulation uh, of ecoclimates suitable for generating highly realistic renderings of outdoor scenes. The joint simulation of these models is a challenging task. In our method, we propose several different simulation spaces. The main goal is to maintain a balance between accuracy and computational efficiency. We use, uh, first of all, an ecosystem continuous space, which describes positions of plants. Uh, we also use a voxel space, uh, which expresses varying life conditions uh, available for plant development. Uh, we also use a voxel space for the simulation of clouds. And finally, uh, we use a vapor and precipitation maps, which describe the water exchange between different simulation spaces. Here, you can see an overview of our model. First of all, a user can specify plant species, elevation model of the terrain, as well as climatic parameters used in the simulation. The vegetation model is responsible for generating the distribution of plants. This distribution is then transformed into a vapor map according to the transpiration attributes of different plant species. The vapor map is used by the weather model to simulate the formation of clouds. As a result of simulating cloud dynamics, precipitation occurs and uh, is subsequently accumulated in a precipitation map. The precipitation map is the input to the soil model, which describes the amount of water available to the plants. This closes the water cycle in our model. We repeatedly evaluate these steps over time, which enables us to model ecoclimate dynamics. Our vegetation model is based on the observation that trees are self-similar structures. We propose a multi-scale approach, which lets us achieve interactive simulation times while maintaining high accuracy. We build the instances of trees by composing a number of modules, which describe the topology of tree branches. The distribution of modules is a result of their self-organization. Finally, we create the ge geometry of branches for the purpose of rendering based on the topological description. Self-organization of tree modules is based on competition of branches for light and for space. We calculate the available light at each node of tree graph representation. We accumulate the light values and compute the vigor as the plant response. Vigor, which describes the growth potential of a plant, is then used to control the growth of tree modules. Furthermore, we compute the intersections of bounding volumes of the modules and optimize it using a gradient-based method. As a result, we obtain a distribution which minimizes the intersections between the modules. We simulate the weather by solving a set of uh, partial differential equations using an Eulerian solver. This allows us to model transitions between different types of water clouds. We extended the Kessler scheme by accounting for plant evapotranspiration and micro microclimatic vapor, which is external vapor not considered directly by our models. The essence of this model are the phase transitions of water as vapor QV, condensed water QC, and rain QR. The computed rain QR is accumulated in a precipitation map used to calculate the amount of surface water over time. Furthermore, our soil model describes the infiltration of surface water and stores the amount of soil water available for plant growth. Specifically, plants take up soil water to grow and improve the rate of infiltration of surface to soil water. We also take into account the topography by calculating water diffusion and advection based on the gradient of terrain slopes. Our soil model is based on the work by Hilary Slambers et al. We extended the model by adding an advection term and also by computing the biomass factor from the discrete plant distribution 
which is computed by our ecosystem model. We also sample over time average precipitation values from the weather model instead of assuming a constant value. Now let us show you some results we generated. With our hybrid continuous and discrete modeling approach, we are able to express well-studied spatial vegetation patterns arising predominantly in arid climates. This includes the dynamic formation of spots, labyrinths, and gaps. Here, you can see the impact of vegetation on cloud formation. We are able to simulate different types of clouds based on the distribution and type of plant. Of course, there is also an impact in the opposite direction, from weather to vegetation. In the top row of images, you can see a dense forest growing in the Yosemite Valley and a thick cloud layer passing through. We then modify vapor values and continue growing the forest. Typical ribbon-like structures emerge due to spa spatial patterning of plants. Finally, severe forest dieback occurs, resulting in an arid impression of the landscape. We can observe a bidirectional feedback between forest and clouds. First, we develop a mature forest. After deforestation, we can observe a change in cloud composition. As the result of wind and precipitation, plants are able to regrow on the empty terrain, which in turn leads to recreation of the initial cloud composition. Due to local description of temperature and water, we are able to simulate varying microclimates. For example, we can observe edge effects forming at the boundaries of a forest due to different species climatic preferences. When the forest regrows after deforestation, the characteristic species composition emerges at the new edges. We also simulated the fan effect, which occurs when cold air approaches a mountain from one side. As a result, of bear warming on the lee side, a different microclimate with different plant species composition develops. This scene is composed of about 200,000 of trees, which are composed of over 1 million modules. The terrain is four kilometers wide. The average computation time of a simulation step takes about eight seconds. You can also notice that we simulate uh, this on two different scales. One is uh, the scale for ecosystem simulation, which uh, one step consists of uh, one fourth of year. And also simultaneously, we calculate uh, weather simulation at much finer step of 6.5 seconds. So these are the real time values. And to compute such a step, uh, we require just a few seconds of computations. Thus, our interactive simulation enables us to validate underlying model hypothesis very efficiently compared to more accurate but computationally expensive methods. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm open to it. Yeah, thank you, Milos, for the fascinating talk. It's uh, truly impressive work. And um, I don't know if we have time now for uh, discussion, some question and answering. Uh, perhaps it would be a good time if, if we still have some time remaining. Katya, do we have time for Q&A? Yes. OK. There aren't any in the chat, so if if people have questions otherwise. Yep, we just see a DOI request in the chat from, uh, from Fabian. I'm sorry, I have some problem with viewing the question. Yes, there is one now. Uh, from Vabi and Redding. Hey Milos, really interesting presentation and nice visualization. Um, could you provide the 
uh, address the DOI is the question. Okay, so uh, I can only provide uh, references to, to two previous work that I mentioned, um, mainly the eco ecosystem uh, simulation and cloud uh, dynamic simulation, because the joint simulation of those two uh, simulations, which I presented today as the EcoClimate project, uh, is not uh, published yet. So uh, I can only provide the references to the previous works. Uh, there's another question. Are there any filter or sensors used for the data or is there a database? Mm, I'm From not, Peter I'm not Rubik. What is the question exactly about? What, what kind of data do you mean? Yes, I don't understand. Peter Rubik is the is the person who asked, are there any filter or sensors used for the data? Uh, okay. Uh, no, we actually did, did not use any, any sensors for, for the data. Uh, we just uh, use uh, some uh, visual references uh, we, we could find out and just tune the parameters uh, by, by ourselves. Yeah, that seems to be all the questions in the question and answer blog. Great, thank you. Well, it sounds like this um, concludes our symposium. So on behalf of everyone, we'd like to thank the speakers and the co-authors for the remarkable scientific contributions. We've had a series of truly amazing works here that I think that paint a Future, or a picture of the future of land surface models. Thank you all for joining us today and taking part in the symposium. Exciting times are ahead as we push technology to new limits.